by the word. And I know that you have already prayed even before you came here today that God will provide growth. Amen. Mm-hmm. Amen. Amen. Let us see the scripture on. Uh, let us see the scripture and let us get ready. Joshua chapter one coming after the book of what? What does this come after? The book of anybody? Deuteronomy. Deuteronomy. There we go. <laughs> You were that kid in class who yes. kind of heard the answer, yes. and then uh, you, after the teeth, hey, I got the answer, here I am. <laughs> the word of God for the people of God says this, after the death of Moses, the servant of the Lord, the Lord said to Joshua, son of Nun, Moses' aid, Moses, my servant is dead. Now then, you and all these people, get ready to cross the Jordan River into the land I am about to give to them. That is, to the Israelites. I will give you every place where your foot, where you set your foot, as I promised Moses. Your territory will extend from the desert to Lebanon and from the great river Euphrates and all the Hittite country to the Mediterranean Sea in the west. No one will be able to stand against you all the days of your life. As I was with Moses, so I will be with you. I will never leave you, nor what, church? Forsake you. Be strong and courageous, because you will lead these people to inherit the land I swore to their ancestors to give them. Be strong and very courageous. Be careful to obey all the law my servant Moses gave you. Do not turn from it to the right or to the left, that you may be successful wherever you go. Keep this book of the law always on your lips. Meditate on it day and night so that you may be careful to do everything written in it then you will be prosperous and successful. Have I not commanded you? Be strong and courageous. Do not be afraid. Do not be discouraged. For the Lord your God will be with you wherever you go. Mm -hmm. Oh God, be with us wherever we go. Let William Williams sit down and let your Holy Spirit stand in my place. Speak to me, speak through me, because I am a sinner, sinner, speak in spite of me. This I pray in the name of Jesus the Christ. Mm -hmm. Amen, amen, amen. Amen. You may be seated. Be strong and courageous. You know, brothers and sisters, I always make my confessions here in the pulpit. There's just something about this space. And I confess that as we move into these winter months, the last uh, quarter of the year, I have not done my due diligence in keeping up with my uh, uh, New Year's resolution. My New Year's resolution was to work out more. I even had a bar put in the, uh, the laundry room, and I even uh, got a, a medicine ball through the uh, pension plan that I'm a part of because I walked a certain amount of steps. I got points, and because those I got points, I, I bought a, a big, giant medicine ball. I even had some extra points, and I bought a, a jump rope that I could jump in and, 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 and do all that to, to get my blood up and running. Huh. Well, I think I've said this story before. First week, I was pulling up, and I hurt my shoulder. <laughs> And so I just never went back to it. I got the medicine ball, and and I was moving and going and going, and then the kids started playing with it, and I let it be their toy. (laughs) 
I got the jump rope and I was jumping outside and I was moving and I was, I was going and, and the handle of the jump rope fell off uh, and I couldn't hold it quite properly so I put that away. And then I got these push-up, uh, uh, these things for push-ups that you can hold on to and, and go at an angle. I got those and one is under the bed and one is somewhere in the laundry room. <laughs> Good intentions indeed, Sister Preston. My brothers and sisters, I wanted to strengthen my muscles. I wanted to bulk up just a little bit. I wanted to get back to that physique that I had when I was a wrestler. And the muscle today I want to speak to you briefly about as we prepare into this new year, as we go into this new season, back to school, the fall, uh, hurricane season, whatever the season that God is putting us in, I want to speak about a different muscle, that muscle of courage. Courage is a muscle like any other. And it only gets stronger the more you use it. But I want to tell you, brothers and sisters, the devil is out there to, to cause your shoulder to hurt. The devil is out there to take your medicine ball away. The devil is out there to take your jump rope and, and make it obsolete. The devil is out there to move your courage and to divide your courage one way or over there so that you don't use it. The devil does not want you to strengthen that muscle of courage as you head into your new season. The culture and the environment, my brothers and sisters, they're around us and they are it's strong, stronger than ever. But I want to remind you and just tell you today that the culture and the environment does not bring definition to your soul, but the God of the universe does. Amen? And some of us, my brothers or sisters, uh, are, 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 are discouraged because the culture, the environment, they have not coddled us. They have not, uh, they have not made us feel good. They have not done something. And so many of us are walking around here discouraged and dismayed and disillusioned. Some of you are discouraged not because you believe God is not working for you, or that God has not shown you what to do. But some of you are walking around here discouraged because you refuse to do what God has told you to do. My brothers and sisters, we look at this Joshua scripture. Nothing in life will ever take, and, and, and there's three, you know, uh, uh, I, I, I I tell people that I get nervous, that, I, that, 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 that I, I'm nervous to speak and, and that I used to have a, a, a kind of a stuttering problem and, and I couldn't say R's and I had to go to speech class and everything. And I look at this scripture and you see several times back and forth that, that God says, uh, be strong and courageous, be strong and very courageous. Be, did I not command you, be strong and courageous. And, and, and maybe I want to identify with God and I say, hey, maybe God has a stuttering problem like I did. <laughs> But God did not. There's something that was, that was definitive about God, what God was saying. Be strong and courageous. Nothing in life will ever take place apart from your strength and courage. Something has, uh, and, and I want to encourage you today. I want to preach to you today. I want to teach with you today. I want to journey alongside of you today that as you are going out into the world, whether it's your school, whether it's your job, whether it's your family, whether it's back to college, whether it's, it's back somewhere else, I want you to see yourself today in the position of Joshua a leader of people. 
You see, church, I think, uh, uh, I think we, we, we as a society are, are looking for a leader. We, we want a leader that, is, that, that, that can say, speak truth to power. We want a leader that can call white supremacy what it is and evil. We want a leader who will be able to stand up to uh, stand up with conviction and stand up with courage, stand up with pride. We seek this leader, but I'm here to tell you today, church, that that leader that you want is right here today. And that if we are going to be a people of faith, a community of faith, wherever we go, it is imperative upon you to take thou leadership role that God has given you. Somebody has to pull the proverbial trigger as a leader. The very nature of leadership means a willingness to stand by yourself and be the visible, even sometimes prophetic reality of what the future looks like. Leadership is not a reflection of where things are, but the reflection of where things ought to be. I'll say that again. Leadership is not a reflection of where things are, but a reflection of where things ought to be. That sometimes, church, we stand, in our, we stand in our families, we stand in our jobs, we stand in the places that God has put us, and, and we want to look and mentor about uh, how things are in the present. But you, as a leader of people, as a leader in your homes, as a leader in the schools, as a leader in the community, your job as a leader is to stand in the gap to be a reflection of not what things are now, but a reflection of what things ought to be in the future. And I tell you, church, you already know it, but I'm going to say it again. Being a leader is lonely, amen? Inherent in leadership is the call to embrace aloneness and resilience. Too many times we're concerned about the number of likes too many times we're concerned about the fallout. Too many times we're concerned about whether someone will like me or not. Too many times we're concerned about not being like or, or too concerned about what he will think of me if I don't do this. Too many times we're concerned about, uh, about what she will go back and tell her friends. Too concerned about everybody at, uh, what everybody at the job does and just trying to get along, to, to go along, to get along. And what I want to say, the message of Joshua 1 today, when you read this text, you must read it in its emotional context and you must understand what's going on at the time. So you must understand that in this midst of aloneness, in the midst of, uh, 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 of having to be a reflection of what things are in the future, you must see what God is saying to Joshua and his people. So let me just get to the text real quick. So, so, so you have Joshua chapter 1, after the death of Moses. And, 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 and so think about, uh, depending on what... Uh, uh, um, what you read and, and, or what theological text you read and, and the footnotes there, they might say that there were somewhat of 2.5 million Israelites standing on this side of the river. And, 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 and my brothers and sisters, they're like many of us today. They're in an emotional funk. Everybody say funk. Oh. Hey. I think there's a song or something for that, right? I promise the funk. <laughs> there you are. I got. I got oh, okay. Never. I'm done. Okay. So so. But they're in an emotional funk, my brothers and sisters, because what has happened at Moses? Y'all know who Moses was. He was the one who went to Pharaoh, mean old big bad Pharaoh, and said, "Let my people go." He was the one that said, "Follow me out of the out into out of the land of Egypt." He is the one that stood at the Red Sea with his staff. And by the power of God, uh, deep uh, part of the Red Sea, and people walked through on dry land. He was the one who went up to Mount Sinai not once but twice and came back with commandments. The, uh, the legendary, the great, the greatest ever. There's no one better that they said at that time. Moses had died. And so imagine, my brothers and sisters, all of what you've been going through, all of what you've been taught, all of what has been your life. 
You hear this man, this promise, this vision, follow me to the promised land on the other side of the river. And right before he gets there, people do what they do best. The pressures get to him. The pressures of, 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 of 2.5 million people in a space get to them. And they begin to go to Moses with this and that. And, and the pressure gets to Moses. And instead of turning to the rock, instead of turning to his anchor, instead of going to the rock, instead of going to God and saying, God, uh, deal with this. God, be a fence. God, uh, 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 do something. Instead of going to the rock, he struck the rock. And because his anger, his frustration, because he struck that rock, because he was disobedient, God said, you will die and not enter the promised land. Now, brothers and sisters, I just want to pause for a moment because we might say, man, God, that's cold-blooded. He was just, you know, the frustrations, the pressure. We've all kind of said and done some things that we regret. We've all kind of been in that high intense situation and yelled at somebody because they did something or talked about somebody or got some sort of pressure among us or did something or even hit somebody or even gossip about somebody and we might not have the sword or the gun but we have the tongue and we said something about somebody because the pressure of the situation overwhelmed us. And we said, man, I want to be like Moses. I don't want the Lord to kill me. But what I'm saying, my brothers and sisters, as, as a man, Moses is a man of God who had been revealed, had, God had revealed his heart to him. And through Jesus Christ, when we profess Christ as our Savior, when we say we're a follower of Jesus, when we say we're a Christian, when we do these things that, that are Christ's life, God is revealing his heart to us. And, and, and what, the, what the, all I'm saying is that those who God reveals his heart to, we have a higher standard. There's no if and buts about it. There's some things that we can't do that other people can't do. And we can't be saying, oh, oh, you know, God, you revealed yourself to me, and, and, but, but I want to be out, in the, I want to do this, I want, no! We have, as those who profess Christ as our Lord, a higher standard. There's no way around it. There's no, you can't get past it. You see, church, it's like my dad used to say. And I, at that time, I kind of thought he was being a little judgy. But as that song says, I understand it better. By and by. by, and by. He said, if you hang with do dogs, you'll become a dog. He saw in me what I didn't see in me. He even used to say, son, don't be like me. Be better than me. It's like what Moses said to Joshua before he died, after he struck that rock back in Deuteronomy. Right before he died, he brought Joshua and said, be better than me, Joshua. Don't wimp out on God. I'm going to die, but you keep moving forward. I'm going to die, but God's work continues. And what we can only see, my brothers and sisters, as described as one of the best commissioning scriptures in God, God comes in the beginning of Joshua chapter 1 directly to Joshua. He doesn't come in a dream. He doesn't come by way of an angel. The scripture says God came to Joshua and gave him an exposition, gave him an encouraging word on why you must have courage. And my brothers and sisters, what you must see from Joshua uh, chapter 1 and pretty much all of it is that leadership, that being called by God is not for the faint-hearted. And as you read his text, it, it, it's, almost like, it's almost like God God pulled Joshua by the lapel and said, I know things are going, I know Moses has died, but you got to get yourself together, boy, because 2.5 million people are depending upon you. I'm reminded of a, of, a, of a time when I was at my wrestling physique weight, you know, one, one, 125, 130, somewhere around there, and and, and I was, uh, I've heard someone say, Jesus. <laughs> it was all muscle mass at that time. 
And, and I, I, I went into this tournament uh, uh, seated number one, uh, ranked high, I, I forget where I was seated, but ranked high, expecting to win. And I went out on the wrestling mat and, and, and I wrestled and I lost my first match. So first place was no longer an option in the way the time for the tournament was set up. And, and I went behind the bench and I started crying. And my dad comes down and, you know, he just looks at me and, 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 and before he, the way I remember, before he could get the words out his mouth, my mom came around and said, boy, stop all that crying. <laughs> my mama, you know, I, I, I thought she was going to come down and say, come here, son, and, and hold me and coddle me and do what my mama does. But she said, stop those tears. And, and I believe she was the first person who, 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 uh, who quoted it. But she said in her way, man up. Get, get, stop those tears and get back up and get ready to get back on that wrestling match. And my dad just kind of put his hands up and said, listen to your mama, boy. <laughs> and, 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 but, but church, I ended up winning the rest of my matches and placing third. And, and I feel that's what's needed today as we go and set into this new journey. As you go back to school, as you go back to your job, as you go back to where God is calling you the season, I think we need to hear today, man up, woman up. You've gone through something. You've had some downs. You're experiencing an emotional roller coaster right now. And it seems like that roller coaster is going down, down faster and faster. You wondered why God has brought you this far. But God is here to say, man up, woman up. Get up and get your blessing. Cross on that other side of the river. Have courage. Courage, my brothers and sisters. You see, Shay, and uh, uh, get ready to bring one and four up. I want to read one through four again. Uh, Isaiah, bring it up real quick because, uh, because it's easy. You say, Pastor, Pastor, okay, good. I'll, ha- I'll have court, courage. Uh, uh, but let, let's go back to verses one through four, please, uh, the beginning. Uh, be- but, but, because, because you can easily say, have courage, but I want you to hear what the word says. Courage, after the death of Moses, the servant of the Lord, the Lord said to Joshua, son of Nun, Moses is A, let's go through four. My, uh, Moses, my servant, is dead. Now then, you and all these people get ready to cross the Jordan to the land I'm about to give to them, to the Israelites. Verse three, I will give you every place where I set your foot as, a pro- uh, as I promised. Verse four, uh, your territory will extend from the desert to Lebanon and from the great Euph- river, the Euphrates, and all the Hittite country to the uh, uh, Meter- Mediterranean Sea in the west. I'm not going to go through all of that. But basically, brothers and sisters, there is no such thing as courage apart from the mission. Just as there is no such thing as faith apart from challenge. Faith is defined by challenge just as courage is defined by mission. You're not just courageous to be courageous, but you're courageous for something. You're courageous for a purpose. And my brothers and sisters, uh, the, the reiteration of what he told Moses to do is something, my brothers and sisters, that has been given to, to his father, to Abraham, or to, to all the ones that came before Moses. And, and what I want you to say is that the mission, that the things, that the purpose that God has given to you, it's not new. It's been given. You just have to go out and do it. And, and I think this is a, a, a great aside that we should say, don't take ourselves too seriously. That just as the mission was given to Moses, is given to God, God is saying, next one up. To a shout out to my brother Isaiah Blackwell, Patriots fan. Boo. <laughs> but, but, but part of what, the, uh, part of what you, you see uh, with the Patriots is, is that, that mentality, next one up, next man up. And all that is saying, church, is that you shouldn't be discouraged. You shouldn't be dismayed. You shouldn't be uh, a heartache when someone uh, dies or when something happens or, or when a position's not filled or when, when something happens, that you as a person of God need to be prepared to fill it and be stand. You know, see what happened, my brothers and sisters, with the Patriots. Uh, I think there was something called uh, deflate gate. Brother Blackwell, a- a- am I right about that? And, and allegedly, <laughs> Tom Brady didn't deflate footballs in order to get a competitive advantage. And, and the, the story goes on to say, sisters and brothers, that the NFL found him guilty. And, and, 
and uh, 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 suspended him for the first four games. And so the coach of the Patriots at that time said, next man up. And, and the backup quarter, quarterback, uh, Galapago, I think his name was, or somebody, don't even remember his name. That's how, but, but he was the backup. He came in and, leaded, uh, and led them uh, 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 and did a great job and, and almost said, will Tom Brady get his job back? But what he said at that time was that it's the next man up, that he was prepared and ready to go. It reminded me of, and then the Patriots ended up winning the Super Bowl, and it reminded me of a time when I was a football player before I got into my wrestling thing, and, and, and I played football, and I was a running back, the tailback, and, and coach said, coach said, William, you're in the game, and dad said, son, always be prepared. You're not, uh, you don't know when they're going to call you into the game. So he said, William, you're in the game. It was like third and goal, and, and they just needed to, get, uh, they needed uh, to score a touchdown. I came in, and gave the position like uh, uh, 22, uh, jump 22-3 down uh, on three, break. And the, 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 the quarterback did and said his thing, and I got into my position. I was ready to go. I looked forward, and, and the quarterback said, hi. I did my stutter step, stop, and I ran, and I got, and I got tackled. <laughs> Church, I wish I could say that, that, that I led the team to victory and they hoisted me up on, on their shoulders, and they said, William, William, will No. That's why I was third string running back. Hey. <laughs> but church, I want to say to you that when God calls you into the game, when God, life is not, you are not in a game, that God has given you a mission, a purpose, and when God gives you that, you must be ready, you must be determined, because God will call you, and you must be there, and when the play is called, when it's time for you to go, I promise you this, God will give you enough blockers, God will give you enough wisdom, God will give you enough strength, God will give you enough grace, God will give you enough mercy, God will give you everything that you need to do to run and score that touchdown so that you might do what God is calling you to do. God does not call the equip, but God equips the call. And too many times, church, we are not prepared when God calls us. Courage requires you to understand the mission. Understand what God is calling you to do. Understand the purpose of what God has for you. Whether you're in school, your job, your ministry, you have to be prepared to be the next one up. Many times we wait until we're in the position to study, to learn, to begin the growing process. And I tell you all these great wrestling stories because that's the, uh, uh, I, I say that, uh, uh, but, get, but, but, the, but you have to be spiritually tuned and prepared and ready for the mission. And because you have a clear understanding of the mission, because you have listened to God, because you have been communicating with God, because you stayed after and took notes with God, because you sat in the front of the class with God while he gave life lessons, because you uh, went to God's office hours, you emailed God, because, you got, because God gave you his text, his snap, his Facebook account, his Twitter account, his Instagram account, his YouTube, his Vimeo, his Periscope, his physical his post office box, his Skype name. He even went all the way back and gave you his MySpace address. He gave you everything that he needed, you needed to have in order to get at God. And because you went to God, because you spoke with God, because you're all prayed up, you have a clear understanding of what God wants you to do. And some of you here today are sitting here today with a clear vision, understanding the clear command from the Lord that it has placed on your heart. And it's time for you to get on board, church. Stop looking at the strategic plan. Stop talking about what you want to do. Stop trying to find logical ways for it to make sense. As the, and as the old timers used to say to me, get your backside in gear. Cross that river and get your blessing. It's been poured out for you today, church. The floodgates of heaven are being poured out for you. And the question isn't, do you have the courage to receive it? But the command is, you have the strength and courage, so go get it. I'm almost done because I want to get y'all out of here. Courage rests upon the assurance of God's presence. 
verses 5 through 9. Let's see them real quick. I'll just, let's, just read, let's just see 5. Verse 5 uh, uh, is there. You have been called to receive God's poured out blessings. You have been called to reflect the future of God's beloved community. You might, uh, we're in this together, church, but my calling is to be the chief executive and teaching officer of this church. Your call is to be the prophet in the world. Your call is to be in service in the mission field. Your call is to be the teacher in the classroom. Your call is to be the encourager to the broken. Your call is to be the giver to the needy. Your call is to be the leader amongst followers. Your call is to give mercy to the distressed. Your call is to provide wisdom to those seeking and knowledge as a result of your insight. Your call to possess faith as small as a mustard seed in the face of undeniable opposition even when in the workplace. You are called to visit those in the hospital as a way of healing. You are called to show miraculous powers of liberation for the imprisoned. You are called to discern, to speak in tongues, meaning you have the ability to share and grow across boundaries. You are called to interpret tongues, meaning being to receptive to the mysteries of God. You are called to render assistance in all the ways there can. You are called to do these things, yes, church, inside the church, but more importantly, you are called to do these things in your daily walk outside the church. But I want you to get this. God never calls us to do anything apart from him. Nearly every time in the Bible, I want you to see, look it up for yourself if you don't believe me. Every time that God has a call, there is some sort of language, there is some sort of scripture about God's assurance. And what I mean by that, church, is that every assignment that God gives is all of his primary ways of sanctifying you, his child, as a leader in your house, in your community, in your school, wherever God is placing you. His calling is a statement of his presence. I want you to get this. Your task as a Christian isn't just some extracurricular activity. It isn't something that you do on your spare time. It isn't something that you have time or if you feel like it or if, you're only or if people are only treating you right. Your task, your call as a Christian isn't a function of how far away or how close something is. Your call as a Christian isn't whether or not potluck dinner is being served or if pastor will be jamming it up on the dance floor. Your call as a Christian is when God gives you a mission that you as a student, as a teacher, a staff person, or as a husband, a wife, a child, a parent, a neighbor, a boss, an employee, whether you are a jack or jack is of all trades, whatever it might be, your call is an assignment that God has given you in his insurance to be with you, Israel. I said all that to say that when you go out there, you, do you really think God would leave Joshua? And so do you really think God will leave you? Think about it, church. God said, man up, woman up. I am with you through this. In some of your situations, some of you are in situations for the very purpose of making change in the situation. I remember, and I want to tell you this real quick, I remember when I was first appointed here, I called some of my seminary professors and we were talking and, and I thought I was saying all the right seminary things like, you know, I'm going to go in and I'm going to listen and I'm going to, to be there, I'm going to to let them teach me. I'm not going to go in and say I know it all and da da this and that and saying all the things that they teach you to say in seminary. And my professor said to this, he said, William, that, all, that might be all well and true, but remember this, you are also called to teach them. You are also called to be a change agent. You are also called to provide something that God has given you. And I want to tell you that, my brothers and sisters, some of you are in the situations that you're in because God is calling you to be a change agent in that situation. God is calling you to make a difference in that situation. God is calling you to stand up in that situation. God is calling you to do something in that situation that you're in. And so it might be well and good that you don't want to rock the boat, but I think, I tell you, I think God sometimes is calling you to rock the boat. You may not want to do something because you don't want to hurt somebody's feelings. I think sometimes God is calling you to hurt somebody's feelings. 
in love, that is. You may not want to be in a situation where you think you want to, to, to step on toes, but sometimes, church, we must be picked up and we must be told it's time to step on toes. It's time to make a difference. It's time to make a change. It's time for somebody to stand up, to be a leader, and take these 2.5 million Israelites over the River Jordan because when you cross that river, there will be lions and tigers and bears. Oh my, there will be people who are trying to break them down. There will be people who will try to kill them. And if you don't encourage them right now, if you don't stand up and have courage and do what you're called to do in the situation that you're in, do you really think you are making a difference? You are a leader, and it will be lonely sometimes, but you must make that difference in your classroom. You must stand up to the bullies. You must be the teacher that, 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 that changes it and it defies all odds. You must be the staffer that takes your job so seriously they think that you are the principal of that school. You must be the one that goes back and is that husband that wife, that neighbor, that says, I'm not looking at the situation that I'm in right now, but I'm looking at the situation God wants me to be in. It's hard out there. It's tough. You read Joshua further, there will be people who are killed. We're at a spirit, in a spiritual battle, church. You have the courage, the strength, and courage. I'm going to let you read on your own verses 7 and 9. And once you read, uh, 7 and 8. And once you read 7 and 8, you'll know why. But if you do 7 and 8 of Joshua chapter 1, I promise you this, you will be strengthened and you will have the courage to continue the journey that God is calling you to do. Amen.